uh, friends on Facebook. We commonly That's start right. about <laughs> seven, and we did start about seven, but we prayed for quite a while. Mm -hmm. So we are entering Luke chapter 13 this evening, and I have titled this particular little bit the quote-unquote news as a chosen opiate. But, what uh, is a chosen opiate? opiate? The news oh. Oh, yeah. is a chosen opiate. <laughs> so anyway, um, I will read Luke chapter 13, verse 1 through 5. Just then, some people came to tell Yeshua about the men from the Galil, that's the Galilee, you know, Greek adds a couple of V's to the end. <laughs> Just then, some people came to tell Yeshua about the men from the Galil whom Pilate had slaughtered even while they were slaughtering animals for sacrifice. His answer to them was, quote, Do you think that just because they died so horribly, these folks from the Galil were worse sinners than all the others from the Galil? No, I tell you, rather, unless you turn to God from your sins, you will all die as they did. Or what about those 18 people who died when the Tower of Shiloh fell on them? Do you think that they were worse offenders than all the other people living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, rather, unless you turn from your sins, you will you will all die similarly. Okay. Similar. Similar. Similarly. 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 Yeah. Similarly. In a similar way. <laughs> <laughs> You'll also die. It's actually similar. Similar. Oh, that's a different word. So um, before I go into my little bit, what bring what comes to mind when you read this particular bit of scripture here? Better put, what is there something that the Holy Spirit puts in you when you read that bit? You'll have to read it again. <laughs> 13, what? <laughs> uh, 13, 1 through 5 of Luke. Read it again. All right. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is uh, telling you. wasn't paying attention. All uh -huh, right. I am sharing your live stream, uh -huh. so... I am doing the business. Oh, well, I'm mm -hmm. <laughs> Just then, some people came to tell Yeshua about the men from the Galil whom Pilate had slaughtered even while they were slaughtering animals for sacrifice. Sacrifice meaning to eat together. Offering meaning you don't eat together. But anyway, <laughs> uh, yeah, we didn't, we didn't know what kind of word to translate Zavak with, so they just put something sacred. So... His answer to them was, quote, do you think that just because they died so horribly, these folks from the Galil were worse sinners than all the others from the Galil? In other words, we're all human. No, I tell you, rather, unless you turn to God from your sins, you will all die as they did. Or what about those 18 people who died when the Tower of Shiloh fell on them? Do you think that they were worse offenders than all the other people living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, rather... Unless you turn from your sins, you will all die similarly. 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 Like three extra syllables. Yeah. Hey, um, so, so the letter. It's kind of like righteousness versus rightness. You know, you got to add vowels. I, maybe we're influenced, and I'm influenced by French or something. Mm -hmm. The vowel language. So, any thoughts come to your mind as you read, or what should I read in the third time? Uh, I have a can of worms question. Okay. This may not be where you want this to go, but uh -huh. it's a question that I've had on my mind for a year. Sure. Is any one sin worse than another sin? No, but there are there are things that are not called sin in the Bible. They're called abomination. And they carry a, a bigger punishment. They carry more problems. And like, for instance, you know, Leviticus 11 and even Leviticus 18. Leviticus 18, there's a different word translated as abomination than is in that one place in Leviticus 11. In Leviticus 18, it means it's something, it's talking about food, i.e. not food. Or there's things that the Bible calls food and meats that the Bible does not call food, but stuff that might make you sick is what the word means. Your body's sick. Like and pork. Well, yeah, the first thing we as Americans think of is pork because 
That's the only that's the one we want. That's or or catfish. Yeah, or yeah. Those I mean, are the two things that you get in trouble for saying in the South. Sure. Well, you know, it's like shrimp. You know, we we in America will you'll hear people say, "Well, I yeah, you know, I'll eat anything." No, you won't. I've never heard any. I've never heard of anyone frying up a rat. <laughs> I've never heard of anyone frying up a a, you know, a worm. You know, no, we we yes, have sorry. very few. We have very few things. It's tough tonight. We have very few things that we in America, which is one of the more kosher nations, we just don't realize it. But I'm saying that to say, to answer your question, sin is sin. But there are things that are not called sin because they're actually physical or mental problems at the time. In so are you saying that in, is it Leviticus 18? Leviticus 18 is about what you eat. Eat. And you're saying that that word is an abomination? Yeah, that word is translated abomination because we didn't, again, didn't know how to translate it. Okay. It means something that can make you, has the possibility of making you physically ill. Okay. okay. In Leviticus 11, the word translated abomination, there is a different word. Okay. And it can make, it's something that either causes or can be a form of mental illness. And it's just talking about sexual deviancy in general. The one place, actually, where it uses that word is about homosexuality in particular. Otherwise, it lists all kinds of, you know, if you go and go out with a cow or something. But the in both of those places, it's not called sin. It's called something rather stronger, actually, if you will. Sin is you're missing the mark. You shot something and you didn't have the strength to get there. Right. In this case, it's something that is in your system and actually is leading either your body the wrong way or your mind the wrong way, depending yeah. on the chapter you're reading. And that's not so much sin as it is something, sin is what you know you do or don't do. These matters are something that has attacked you. You know, that, that, uh, that worm that you ate, that mouse that you ate, you know, or whatever, that dog that you ate is, something in it is attacking your body. You know, if we didn't cure pigs like we do, then there would be something, you know, I think most people now, well, okay, a growing number of people now know that influenza came from a pig farm. But it's because of a little thing within the meat, a little critter that you actually can't cook out, that can get in you and cause you to anywhere from, you know, have bathroom problems to actually get you in the hospital. So let's talk about abomination a little bit more. So what we know is that there's two words translated abomination in our Bibles originally were two different words. Two different One's words. about mental stuff, perversion, sexual stuff, things like that. One's about things you eat and how they can make you sick. Yeah. Okay. Either Where? What about, or... what about it, like in Revelation? Or is the abomination mentioned in Revelation? Yeah, I haven't looked up those words. But... The abomination of desolation. You know, the abomination of desolation was, it's more the Leviticus 11 sort of thing because there yeah. was a pig on the altar. Yeah. And that's actually where, okay, why is pig so, why is pigs being shoved at us so much? Isaiah 66 and the deeds of Antiochus IV. And Isaiah 66 about the last days and pre the pre- uh, Basically, the figure of Antichrist before the Antichrist is very much revealed. Antiochus IV was the precursor of the Antichrist. He said, offered a pig, but um, on a grill. Grill, altar, details. But the altar is the nice Latin word. We call it a barbecue grill. It's the, right. it's the special grill. The special grill, yes. But, bomb, you know, that's using the, the word abomination that you find in Leviticus 11. So, yeah, abomination is nice cover-all word because we didn't know the details of what what those two different words meant. But basically boils down to once upon a time, and some good psychiatrists like the one sitting before me would acknowledge that, that sexual deviancy can have something to do with mental problems. Uh, the whole the whole of the psychiatric community prior to say 1969 1970 more leaned that direction but that's been there was an there was an attack on the psychiatric community for a long time 
anyway, um, saying that to say that there are things that can cause physical illness and there are things that can be matters of mental illness as well. And that's most every Bible will translate that as abomination, but that's not necessarily sin as much as it is a problem within yourself that is attacking you. That's why it's the problem of so many <laughs> you gotta watch out for the abominable smell. So the fruit of somebody that's struggling with that could be not pretty, or could be sin. Does that make sense? Yeah, make I mean, more the, sense? yeah, the fruit of somebody struggling, struggling with, that, with that, or you know, affected by the mental issues of that, could yes um, produce things that would be counter to fruit of the spirit. For instance, fruit of the spirit mm -hmm. goes along with gentleness, kindness, self-control, mm -hmm. that sort of thing, where what would come out when your mind is so affected would be opposite of self-control, opposite of kindness and gentleness and, mm -hmm. you know, so forth. So, mm -hmm. yes. Okay. So, what about the difference between, you know, good old gossip and blaspheming the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. which the Bible says is not forgivable. Yeah, so long as you are blaspheming the Holy Spirit. I mean, the repentance is always preceded, precedes forgiveness. You always, always, always in the Bible. Same with blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. It's just uh, we've kind of misunderstood that for centuries. If you're blaspheming the Holy Spirit, you're talking against, basically, you. it's kind of like saying, well, I love Jesus, but I hate God. Well, that's, you're deeply confused. If you're, if you're, yeah. if you're saying much the same thing, you're basically being anti-Christ, you're being anti-Holy Spirit, who is going to show you the Christ. But so long as you're like, if you continue stabbing me, then, you know, I can't forgive you so long as you keep stabbing me. I mean, you know, I'd like to forgive you for stabbing me, but you just keep on. But, you know, it's it's really a matter of, you know. But then what about that forgiving 70 times, whatever? Yeah. And that's that goes back to. Stab me again. <laughs> I can't remember the I can't remember the guy's name in Genesis who, if you read it carefully, he had he has 70 times that he will take vengeance. And our Lord uses that and says, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, forgive 70 times seven, you know, so the, the matter is saying, Hey, go the opposite direction, full force, you know, be full, be forgiven, be forgiving in a totally opposite direction in a full force way, like always. Mm -hmm. And that's a matter of the Holy spirit flowing through us. It is. I need some more of that. Well, we all do. It's uh the Holy Spirit, I mean, goodness, look at how God treats us. Like I said last week, we, we all live each day, not necessarily, you know, going by the Bible that we believe we're going by. And somewhere along the way, we'll mess up. But God offers mercy. He offers grace. He offers forgiveness. And these are matters that we can grow to be more and more like. Again, the steps of growth turn into, after you get through to that point of hasidut, or the Bible translates it as godliness, because again, we didn't know how to, asuvias, or suvia in Greek is a difficult one. But uh, hasidut is the nice Hebrew word where you're basically, you're experiencing a, a covenant relationship with one another. After that is brotherly love and then agape. So you're in the right direction for going toward that kind of love that is not easily provoked, is not, you know, it just, it simply loves. And Scholar Ministries as a group has gone through those growth steps. I've watched it and we're, we're very much on the verge of knowing, being able to experience out of our own selves that, the deepness of that kind of love that is not provoked. Somebody might scream at us, and no, that does not provoke me. I can still yet show you love because this is love personified. Agape is love personified. It's, well, 
God is love. He's not feeling, he is love. So agape transcends what's the feelings that are going on inside of you and go kind of overrides that. Yeah. And that's, I know that's a must in me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Well, you remember our friend Martin? Yeah. He insisted that there were different levels of sin. That's why I asked that question. There are, I, I mean, to, agree with him. I mean, to, for, uh -oh. you know, it's, you know, kind of, you know, I imagine it would be, I mean, you know, saying that, you know, lying is the same as murdering somebody, you know, just on, <coughs> On the face of it, sounds wrong, and I, I would say, like, maybe a better way to think of it would be on um, yeah, as sense. far as you know, uh, as far as like you know, say you know, the afterlife or whatever is concerned. Then you know, all sin, you know, sin is sin. You know, you'll get you, you get uh, you know the punishment for that either way. But as far as our world is concerned, there's definitely different levels. Of, oh yeah, like, you know. We, so. when we see sin and it happens to us or happens within us, there are different effects. There's different levels of effects and how that, how that comes out and what that does and so forth. Sin is a word that simply means you didn't get there. You missed it altogether. But there are degrees of what that affects. Lashon hara. We've talked for many years, the, the slanderous tongue, the mur yeah, murder by mouth, has a very harsh effect. Um, me kicking the dog doesn't have so much of a greater great effect as Lashon Hara does. Or blood guilt. Blood, blood guilt. guilt, murder, abortion, blood yeah. guilt. I there, are, there are sins really that bad. we wink at, and there are sins that are greatly, that greatly affect us, you know, and affect society in general. You know, Cain had the, the blood guilt. Yeah. So, yes, ma'am. I'll, I'll try to say it the way I'm thinking it, but it may not come out right. In my mind, that question, we, we all know that there's punishment for missing the mark. The body of sin, like Cal said, mm -hmm. that the there's a cost. Right. Okay. Um, requires repentance, forgiveness, the whole nine yards. Another way that I think about it is in scripture, there, there's missing the mark by a half degree, and then there's missing the mark by 180, you're really screwing up. Yeah. Okay. All equally point. forgivable, but in the absence of repentance and forgiveness, there are different levels of sin and the punishment, not necessarily always by God. Sometimes it's just mm -hmm. by the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. But there are different levels of sin that will do more or less damage to you I while see, you're in them. I see what you're saying when you explain it that way. My, my mind really is because of, can I say, the position I'm in. I... I, at the bottom line in me, it's a matter, you know, I, I, I could preach salvation to the, till I die. And that's about the nature of sin. Right. You know, the body sin, of yeah, sin. Yeah. Rather than sins, plural. Right. And so I, I understand what you're saying. And you're basically saying what I was saying there, you know, some things have less effect and some things have this great, huge, you know. Right. And to me, effect is different from repercussion yeah. you know effect is how it goes out from you uh when i think of the different levels of sin it's also what's going to come back at you mm -hmm. whether that is godly discipline you know if you are serving god there will be godly discipline if you are not serving god there will be godly discipline mm -hmm. And that level of discipline or uh, earthly punishment is going to be different. Mm. And there are sins, sins with the S, that lead to death. Mm. And then there are sins that don't. 
They're yeah. just like, get it taken care of. Well, it's yeah. not going to kill you. The wage of any sin is death. It's just a matter of, you know, how merciful is God or, or nature itself at the, at the moment. God's mercy is never ending. Nature may not have so much mercy, but you know, that's, I think we all understand that. You know, if I, if I go out in the middle of the interstate up here and point a gun at somebody, which I don't even own a gun anymore, point a gun at somebody and try to shoot them, the, na- the, the, the nature of, that. yeah, the nature of the nature itself will have a, a much faster, you know, judgment on me, you know, but so, you know, there's, <laughs> yes, there's, there are sins that are more stupid than others as well. <laughs> Well, and you also have to think about it. Scripture says that there will be individuals who come scooting in with their pants on fire. Yeah. That's the Rebecca (laughs) version, Mm -hmm. but that's what it says. Yeah. That, you know, they may come in just by the skin of their teeth, but they made it. A good example of that is, I think, so many people are fine or remembering maybe they went to Bible school and didn't pay much attention to it because we we're taught to not pay much attention to these things. But um, um, Constantine, Emperor Constantine, the you know, everybody, you yeah. know, we hear so much about his he was a Christian. Well, yeah, he was a Christian the day he died. That's when he actually he became, made it with his pants on he fire. He probably made it with his pants on fire because he died as he he was he died in baptism. <laughs> And that, that's how he yeah. died. And it's because that's the day that he... Did they hold him under? No, they didn't hold him under. That This was this was from a Catholic point of view where oh, you sprinkle. sprinkle and stuff, but they just kept dumping him on him because uh, the bishops did not like Constantine because he was an evil man. But the day he was dying, he turned... He, he repented. But uh, so anyway, yeah, that that's... Basically, what scripture would say made it in with his pants on fire. He was heading in the wrong direction until the very last second. But, yeah, so. So this context is a little bit different than our our discussion of the last 20 minutes. (laughs) The, um, The matter here is news and how you're affected by the news. And you can read it again if you like, but, you know. Oh, some people came and told this particular story of what happened over here. And, you know, so how how are we affected by that and so forth? So my little note is this. Make no mistake about it. Pilate's brutality was well known. Okay, you can do your history. Pilate was not a nice man. He was a Roman, you know, officer. He's a Roman, not centurion, uh, governor. Which means that he didn't put up with find a word like judgment. I would say it's it's finding us out in terms of how we would like to think that we can tell the virus what it's going to do, like we have that capability. But you know we can study, yes, but actually predict on you know how this is going to be. I I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if we've all had this particular virus because it can be asymptomatic, mm-hmm. but. You know, it's that's just it. You, you know, it, it doesn't act the way we think it's going to act. And when something comes about that you cannot figure out one hundred percent, it basically points the finger back at us. So yes, in that sense, it's a. It can, like I said, it can be something of a distraction to to make up all of these scenarios and come into more of a cartoonish way of life in our imaginations. And that's a big, imagination be a huge distraction. But if we want to really break it down to reality, like this is, you know, he's, he's saying, hey, you're all gonna die. Guess what? You know, the way you, Adam and Eve affected something, you're all gonna die. And there's no, there's no one who's worse sinner than the rest of the sinners. But in terms of this big distraction, yeah, Pilate was Pilate today. He killed some people. Guess what? He does that quite a lot. Uh, this bad thing happened over here. Guess what? It happens quite a lot. 
There have always been bad things that happen rather daily. But rather than be distracted by them, let's do God's word. And that begins, yes, with repentance in each one of us. You can't do God's word unless the Holy Spirit is flowing through you, according to Romans chapter 8. It's not possible. But repentance brings about his, it opens the door for him to flow through us. Mm -hmm. So maybe God is allowing it to occur as a shaking, awakening, It'd be to, great. to test, to, te- to like test the, his church of whether or not they can rise up and and take care of things and be the church that they're supposed to be. Yeah, you it'd know be great I mean? if we could all wake up. It'd be marvelous. Um, ten virgins are asleep and they're virgins, i.e., Christians. Ten, not five, not seven, not ninety percent. Ten, all ten, and. But there are some beginning to wake up, and that's, that's the real issue, is are we going to rush into reality, or are we going to play the drowsy, you know, the drowsy cartoon game, imagine, imagination game? And, you know, I'd, I would much rather, you know, it, it, it weakens us. Okay, here's a nice little cartoon scenario. Um, There's a difference between magic and God's power. There's a difference between magic tricks and what God does. You see that in the ten plagues in Egypt. There There was a time when the magicians couldn't pull the wool over your eyes anymore. And they could duplicate with their little, you know, sleight of hand, but they couldn't do the, just the simple fact of what God was doing. So if I, I feel like maybe 10 people, maybe 10,000 people can get together, like in a war or in a stadium or, you know, on a football field, you know, or, you know, 12, you know, you know, people playing football or basketball or something like that, all running into each other, skip social distancing or mask. But don't, don't gather at church. And if you gather at church, some might, might die because you had more faith in the gathering than you did in God himself. You had more faith in your own actions of gathering than you did in the spirit of the Lord himself. But it's a matter of really actually, actually following the book rather than our traditions, our imaginations, our cartoons, and really breaking down to getting back to this book. Amen. Yes, ma'am. I don't really have anything to say about it. I just wanted to read this to you because I was reading this a lot the past couple of weeks. Second Chronicles seven twelve. Um, we hear a lot about the if my people will turn and pray, you know, yeah, you know, think okay, well here's the humble themselves. Here's the paragraph. Verse twelve. Adonai appeared to Solomon or Shlomo. That's all Shlomo Solomon, yes. Yeah, Solomon. By night and said to him, quote, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice, as the church. If I shut up the sky so that there is no rain, or if I order locusts to devour the land, or if I send an epidemic of sickness among my people, then if my people who bear my name will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and turn from their evil ways, it's talking about the church, you know, yeah. the people who serve them. Right. Turn from their evil ways. I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. Now my eyes will be opened and my ears will pay attention to the prayer made in this book. Yeah, I appreciate the full context there. Mm-hmm. Thank you. And because, yes, it is a matter of allow. we have to allow these things to wake us up and cause us to return to him and return to his book. And by the way, 
the God, his spirit, his person in this book are not separate things. His spirit authored this book. When it says that all scripture is inspired, that's what that means. Different writers, but he is the author. So if you're separating this book from him, you are also rather confused. Jesus, Yeshua, is this book made flesh. He's the word made flesh. So don't think that this book is any light matter. It is extraordinary. I just want to say that. I just want to put that out on Facebook. I know we all think, believe that, but I just want anyone who's listening in or will listen in later to understand. You know, we have to allow our ways to come second place to this. Yeah. And it wasn't ignorant men who penned it. And these were, just read the structure, you know, even in Hebrew, but these were intellectuals, yeah. some of them. Some mm -hmm. of them were fishermen. But I think we sometimes think that they were written by lesser people because it was a couple thousand years ago or whatever. Um, they, they would go toe-to-toe -to -toe with any intellect, you know, alive today. Oh, I, yeah. When I read the Hebrew text, I'm thinking that we're the stupid ones. And <laughs> Do what? I'm sorry. When I read the Hebrew text, I'm thinking we're the stupid ones. You just follow education itself, the manner and what things were taught even, even 150, 200 years ago, and you'll find that we have greatly re been reduced in our... Some of us are fishermen, some of us are Solomon. It just, I mean, still today, there's incredibly intelligent people, and then there are people that know things with their gut. God will speak to them in a very, very different way. So we're no better, no worse. Yeah, Amos was, Amos, Amos was a contemporary of Isaiah. Isaiah was from Jerusalem. Amos was a shepherd. Isaiah used words that only he uses. You cannot find them anywhere else in the Bible in terms of Hebrew words. He was extraordinarily intelligent, more intelligent than any other Bible writer in terms of his word usage. Amos was Amos and Jonah both are some of the easiest stuff to read because they're very simple in their presentations. They use extraordinarily common language. Moses in this what's called the Song of Moses, not not Exodus 15, but uh Exodus 30, 32, I believe, you know, when he was dying and he wrote that song, um, he uses, that's when he breaks out and reveals that he's extraordinarily intelligent. The rest of his writing is made to be read by the common bear. But when he sings his own tune, he, he, he blow you away on some of the wording that he uses. So yeah, the, this is no, this is not a book that we should all think is silly. It's uh, it's a rather challenging book. It's divine. It is divine. <laughs> One of the, of course, the notes in this, I've never considered it with the angle of, like, the news. Mm -hmm. um, I've always looked at it as... And, and the notes here in this little study Bible are taking it from this perspective too. And I don't, it, I don't think it's wrong. I just think mm -hmm. it's a different way of looking at it. Sure. Um, the the people are asking Jesus, "Hey, you know these folks were killed by these Galileans were killed by Pilate while they were." Making a sacrifice, you know, they're getting ready to eat, um, as you said. And then the implication there, you know, the way Jesus takes it, the way he answers it, is, is that apparently they were asking, what did they do to deserve that? Were they especially bad sinners? Had they sinned more than mm -hmm. any of us? Because Jesus responds, do you think because they died so horribly, these folks were worse sinners right. than all the others in the gallery? No, I tell you, you know, where you turn 
unless you turn to God from your sins, you will die just as they did. Um, and we're all going to die pretty much anyway. It's not the physical death that Jesus is referring to here. It's, right. You know, deeper, more. We're all going to die the physical death. But right. That's the way they did. So he's taking yeah. their minds off of a physical death and on to eternal. Yeah. They they died both physical and spiritual. Yeah. And, right. and the, the second, verse four and five, again, he takes, okay, a, a tower fell. And the notes here say, like, Southeast Jerusalem, mm. Siloam, um, and squished some folks. And he said, where they were sinners, else in Jerusalem he said no mm -hmm. that's not how this works right um, and it's, it's not necessarily he's grading sins or the amount of sin that any particular individual has done um, more so you know keep your eyes on what's important we're all going to die yeah and unless you turn to God from your sins you're going to die a death that's permanent um, and it seems to be that and this is what I was looking up. There's this concept, apparently fairly common back then, actually not that uncommon nowadays too, that um, how sinful or how good a life you lead uh, is kind of like the Jesus Times version of the prosperity gospel. Mm -hmm. You know, if you don't sin and do a lot of good works, you'll, you'll, God will bless you and you'll be wealthy and healthy. And, you'll have a tower full of Yeah, and you won't be squished by a tower. And your afterlife will be um, better. Yeah, and, and so therefore, if you get squished by a tower, it must have been because you sinned. It must have been because you did something to deserve it. Um, Jesus, of course, in John chapter 9, uh, verses one, 1 through 3. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. So they were, uh, as a variant of that, that beliefs or that understanding of what sin is and how sin works, is that sin was handed down from your parents to you if you were born with some sort of physical defect or something else like that. Mm -hmm. so it must have been, you know, punishment for your parents' sin. Jack. And or your so, grandparents or your great-grandparents. Yeah. And so um, there seems to be that, that angle on it that these people that are coming to Jesus are also, uh, you know, in our verses tonight, are kind of taking it. And Jesus is trying to refocus them away from that. He's doing it fairly, fairly gently, I would say, mm -hmm. um, onto a different way of understanding sin. Right. And um, you know, if you throw on this angle about the news, He's not, let me maybe translate it into current events. Mm -hmm. It's not, maybe, that the coronavirus and the you know, hundreds of thousands of people worldwide who, who have died from it mm -hmm. is, is a good thing or a bad thing or a punishment for sin or anything like mm -hmm. that. Um, what he wants us to focus on is maybe did those people know Christ? Right. And we can spend a lot of time and money and effort arguing over those deaths, or we can use that as a re recognition, realization that we're all going to die at some point. And have I been wasting my time? doing other things and up to and including worrying about getting sick mm -hmm. that maybe I should have been doing spreading the gospel. Right. And that's um, what I was saying earlier, you know, in terms of this virus, 
it. Okay, let me get a little, little bit more specific. We have said that in, in the past, we said, well, Sweden, we don't like Sweden. They're going to get hit hard, you know, because they deserve it. Who said that? No, it just, it was, I can't remember who said it exactly, but it was kind of floating around from the media. Media, Almost basically. Everybody that was freaking out. Yeah. <laughs> media and folks that were supposed to be experts kind of freaking out and saying, well, you know, because Sweden didn't do this, they didn't prepare like everybody was supposed to prepare or do the things that and we don't like them. And so the virus is going to hit them hard because they, they sinned. And the virus didn't really hit Sweden nearly as hard. In fact, a little bit less than the average place. And just using that as one example, that it, it affects different areas quite differently than what we projected because we projected along the lines of, well, they deserve this. You know, and, and quite honestly, we it's almost as if folks have had a death wish. But but that's, yeah, it's the wrong attitude. And that I kind of said it rather vaguely earlier that we have been doing what was, what's been done here. Well, did, did they deserve it more? Did they sin more? And that's where I intend to say that sin being sin. Now, yes, it has, you know, if I... If I whip out a baseball bat and decide I'm going to clobber Brian over the head, then yeah, that's going to have a much greater effect. But it's still sin. It's still missing that mark. It just missed it by a great deal more, as my spouse put it. But I think I said that about Sweden. <laughs> well, it's been said about Sweden for you know a few months. I'm sorry about the missing the mark thing. <laughs> yeah, that's. No, I didn't mean what you were saying earlier. Get with me. You did that. Oh. Maybe I was wrong. Well, you I'm know, sorry. I, no, we all, I, I think, I think we tend to, to do that. Well, you know, so-and-so is actually deserving of this because they went, they, they didn't follow protocol or they went the wrong way in this regard and so forth. Well, did they do something against the Bible or they, did they do something against, you know, what a friend of mine would call quote unquote social norms? And sometimes there's a difference between the Bible and social norms. The Bible is the word of God. Social norms may or may not be. And so if it... Well, be, Sweden is a anti-Semitic goat nation. Yeah. So they are against Israel and therefore... Right. So, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, well, I mean, there's... I could, I could take you not too far away from here and bring you to anti-Semitic people mm -hmm. uh, living around here and, and, and throughout Arkansas. But, but as a nation, yeah, you know, as a nation, you know, Israel, what is it? I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you, Israel, right? right? Literally damn those who, mm -hmm. but the... So as a nation, yeah, but what that, different nations yeah. do towards Israel can affect, right. can bring on them. Yeah. Blessings or curses. And here I have a love for Muslim people. <laughs> mm -hmm who by Quran should, you know, and Quran does have great things to say about actually Yeshua himself, but and then on the other side of it can be extraordinarily anti-Semitic and telling people to be anti-Semitic. If you find the Jew under a rock, kill him, you know, that sort of thing. But that's God's responsibility to damn those, yeah. not mine. True. <laughs> Very good question. Yeah. They, there's, you know, this this is spoken of in in James, I believe it's the third chapter, fourth chapter, you know, whether or not we sit in the chair, in God's chair or not, and be that particular word for judge. Yeah. But, yeah, the, uh, my point here was the news can sway us and how we view things and how we think. And how we think of others, how we, I mean, the news need not be that matter so, so important as to become an opiate. And that's what I'm saying is it can. We can, we can hear this and this about this nation or that nation. And yeah, it may be true. It may be quite true. But what they say about that and what they influence 
uh, and how they influence us to think and project our feelings and so forth may or may not be according to this book. And I can, I understand why the news is the news and so forth, but we need not treat it as any more than somebody sharing information. And nowadays, yes, somebody may be trying to influence the direction of your thinking processes and therefore your actions. So how you think about, love your enemies, pray for those who despitefully use you. So that's because the word for neighbor and the word for enemy, aside from vowels and Hebrew is not based on vowels, it's based on consonants, consonants, but in terms of the consonants of the word for enemy and the word for neighbor, they're the same consonant, they're the same word. Consonants. Consonants. Consonants, thank you. There you go. Uh, you had an extra T in there. Yeah. I'll tell you, am I yeah. drawing more from French or from, yeah, I guess it, it is Swedish that, you know, it's very uh, oh, consonant. Go, Lingo. But anyway, um, <laughs> I have no the, the point Swedish. being is... It is the Lord himself who is to be the judge of a person's soul, not us. And we need not allow the news to be so important to us that it actually influences how we think of other people and how we think of our, our duty to take the good news of the Messiah to other people. So that's, that's the point of that first paragraph. I haven't read all that I wrote down on this. Shall I read more? Sure. I don't think we're going to finish the chapter. No, no, no. no, I don't think so. Being as we just started, I haven't really finished these first little bit. But the question remains, uh, are we, as ethnic Jews or otherwise, shining our light, quote unquote, light to the world around us? Quote, furthermore, he gave some people as emissaries, some as prophets, some as proclaimers of the good news, and some as shepherds and teachers. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. But we all have the capability to, quote, let our light shine before people so that they may see the good things you do and praise your Father in heaven, end of quote. Your light is the good stuff that you do, getting out of your house, getting out of your norm, going and, and crossing those thresholds in order to shine that light within any and all of these callings. All of these callings in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 can properly shine light through the good things that you do, that we do. And yes, I will point out that the phrase shepherds and teachers calls to mind two different offices yet in, intermingled. Shepherds and teachers, any shepherd, i.e. pastor, that's the nice Latin word. Can teach, and any teacher can be a pastor if they actually recognize these verses. Because that, that's where, in that phrase, they are actually combined. Actually meant to be. That is, a good teacher should always have a shepherding way about him or her, and a good shepherd or pastor should have a teaching way about him or her. They can actually function as one quote-unquote office. Just thought I'd throw that in as a parenthetical. Because in the text, they can function as one well. of so, Any other thoughts on, basically said in that, that latter paragraph, what I was saying as we were talking, we all have the ability to step beyond the news we hear. We're always going to hear of bad news. In fact, probably, yes, more of it. But that does not stop us from, should not stop us, from doing the call that we've been called to do, which is, bottom line, share the good news of the Savior who has come to save us from sin, not from hard times, not from trouble in the world, not from the daily news of hard times, but from sin. Sin being, for one thing, being distracted by the news. <laughs> Any other thoughts? Mercy is a great name. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, we could go a little bit further, but we've now been at it for an hour. I mean, if you want to go a little bit further, that's okay. I, 
I would go as far as um, chapter 13, 10 through 17. And it actually fits. Okay, I'll read it. <laughs> chapter 13, 10 through 17 reads like this. Actually, yeah, I think I, okay, yeah, I, did, I didn't go to verse 9 earlier. Yeah, I didn't do 6 through 9. I did, yeah, I meant to do 6 through 9 earlier, so I'll just add it in. Then Yeshua gave this illustration. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. This is in context, by the way. He gave this illustration of what he was just talking about. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit, but yeah. didn't find didn't find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, <clears throat> restless individuals, be you dogs or otherwise, I'm reading this book. Then Yeshua gave this illustration. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit, but didn't find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, here, I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree for year, three years now without finding any. Cut it down. Now, by the way, it usually takes four years for any fruit-bearing tree to begin bearing fruit from the time you originally planted. Fig trees are a little quicker. Here I've come looking for fruit on this fig tree for three years now without finding any. Cut it down. Why let it go on using up the soil? But he answered, sir, leave it alone one more year. I'll dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. If not, you will... Have it cut down. Have it cut down then. Verse 10 through, and that's that's the matter of, again, in context of producing good fruit. Verse 10 through 17 goes on to say, Yeshua was teaching in one of the synagogues on Shabbat, on the Sabbath. A woman came up who had a spirit which had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent double and unable to stand erect at all. On seeing her, Yeshua called her and said to her, Lady, you have been set free from your weakness. She put her, his hands on her, and at once she stood upright and began to glorify God. But the president of the synagogue, indignant that Yeshua had healed on Shabbat, spoke up and said to the congregation, quote, There are six days in the week for working, so come during those days to be healed, not on Shabbat. However, however, the Lord answered him. It should be all caps in the word Lord there, I believe. The Lord answered him, you hypocrites, each one of you on Shabbat, don't you unloose your ox or your donkey from the stall and lead him off, off to drink. This woman is a daughter of Abraham and the adversary kept her tied up for 18 years. Shouldn't she be freed on the, uh, from this bondage on Shabbat? But these words, by these words, you should put to shame the people who opposed him. But the rest of the crowd were happy about all the wonderful things that were taking place around him or through him. Pardon me. So thoughts about this passage. Bit of a different occasion here, a different scene, different context, but still a similar message. Okay, let me, I only have one paragraph on this. I've taught in the past that the restriction on Shabbat is specifically against going to your job. It says work or labor, the word translated work, malaka, has to do with going out, going out to your job. And, uh, or against, it's also against hard labor, per the actual text. And I have pointed out that we must, ask, we may ask any woman, uh, any mother you want about the word, what the word labor means. Yes, even the word Shabbat means to stop. Mm -hmm. But it does not mean, you know, quote unquote, do, do not exit your bed. It does not mean that. If there is any quote-unquote deed to be done on Shabbat, even within Shabbat congregational gatherings, it is that of, quote, releasing those unjustly bound and tying the thongs of the yoke, letting the oppressed go free, breaking every yoke, sharing your food with the hungry, 
taking the homeless poor into your house, clothing the naked when you see them, fulfilling your duty to your kinsmen, end of quote. Isaiah 58, verses 6 through 7. Isaiah 58 is generally taken to speak of an attitude on Yom HaKippurim, or the Day of Atonement. However, reading a bit further within said chapter, as in the next bit, uh, verses 13 through 14, one will find that this is actually an attitude to be found on Shabbat. It is in the context of how the Sabbath should be, even within congregational gatherings. Again, this passage within the Gospels is not about Yeshua being outlandish or even forbidding the act of Shabbat. He's not saying don't, don't do Sabbath or don't, don't have a time of rest even within congregational gatherings. But what is rest to the person who's hurting? What is rest to the person who's hungry? <laughs> Rather, our fully Jewish Savior is reminding us of the same Old Testament way of doing Shabbat. He's drawing from Isaiah chapter 58. So, again, this is something that should be the, uh, the halakha, the works of law, works of law referring to rabbinic law, the halakha of the time what, had figured out what not to do on Sabbath. It had not actually delineated what should be done on the Sabbath because it didn't want to go there. You shouldn't do anything on the Sabbath. That's why I said you can get out of bed. But Yeshua basically comes and says, okay, I've, I've got the halakha for what to do. It's already stated in the Bible. And that is tend to, <laughs> tend to doing the will of the Lord for people who aren't quite as good in good health as you are, don't have the food that you have, may be all tied up in whatever is tying them up, whatever has them bound. There are folks that need help. Tend to them on the Sabbath. If there's mm -hmm. anything that the Sabbath is about, it is stopping that which is bad and bringing about that which is good. It is about healing. It is about health. It is about seeing people freed. So it's following the same context actually is what we talked about before, but it's now bringing it from the other six days into the congregation or gathering time, otherwise called Shabbat. Any other thoughts concerning that? I only read you my one paragraph and commented myself. Okay. Yes, ma'am? Basically priorities. Basically priorities. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Priorities, indeed. If, if we say... And I don't think any of us take this idea that the Sabbath is something, you know, of all that you don't do. But yeah, the, the priorities of the six-day work week are, hey, you know, do your job, do it well, do it to the honor of the Lord. On the Sabbath, to way, the way to honor the Lord is something that you should do through the rest, rest, rest of the week as well, but you have more opportunity perhaps on the Sabbath. And that is, do that which is good for somebody else. See that they're freed up. Okay, so I'm repeating myself. So, no Jewish babies are born on the Sabbath? <laughs> because their mothers can't go in a way? Right. Uh Oh, yeah. they can't work. Well, in fact, I'm, I, I was in my notes. I said, you know, ask any mother what the word labor means. That Jewish baby That's was born on a Saturday. Mm -hmm. Woo, you're a Sabbath baby. Mm -hmm. And so was You were born in sin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. That's but, I have no idea what day my children were born on. <laughs> But I, I know the, I yeah, know the, the calendar date. I have no clue what. Well, again, you can look at it as the labor that you did, or you can look at it as the life that you gave. And that's what Shabbat is actually about. So, you know, it, it's going to it's going to take a certain amount of doing something to bring about help for somebody else. So, but that is. Yes, you've probably seen stop signs that have the, the Hebrew word Shabbat on them because that's what Shabbat means, to stop. 
but that doesn't mean never get out of bed. John was a Sabbath babe to you. Yeah. He just looked at me. Yeah. But Lucas was also a Sabbath babe. Well, we had two Sabbath babies. Mm-hmm. Oh my goodness. And Braylon and Jill too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> our prettiest <laughs> wait for the weekend. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there you go. It's All fun. right. So if there's a message tonight, I believe it is don't be distracted. Don't use, don't allow the usual bad stuff that goes on around the world. And it does go around the world. There are a whole lot of other pandemics as well. Just don't talk about them. But don't allow that to distract you from doing helpful things, even about those pandemics. Pandemics such as unborn babies being, yeah, anyway. (laughs) So shall we close this particular time in prayer? Heavenly Father, thank you for this evening again. Thank you for Shabbat as we enter into it. As Ephesians chapter 4, or pardon me, Hebrews chapter 4, so calls us to do is enter into Shabbat. And thank you for that call to enter into what you have provided, not merely a, a day of rest, but to enter into who you are. You are our freedom from sin. So, Father, thank you for providing that, and we will take in your provision. And again, we thank you for upcoming things and trust in your shalom, your peace, your wholeness to be there. And for the rest of this evening, we thank you for your rest and trust that you will allow us to to rest and catch up on rest, even in the morning. So thank you again for your provision and for your leading us to share the gospel and to do good for others. B'Shem Yeshua in Jesus' name. Amen.